everybody, my name is Dr. Samantha Monroe, and I am an ecologist. That means I study plants and animals and how they interact with their environment. So far on this channel, I've done a few different videos that have explored why species go extinct and what we can do to protect them. And if you've watched any of these videos, you know that species can become threatened with extinction for a variety of reasons, including hunting, overfishing, and of course, climate change. Although I know <laughs> probably most of you haven't watched them. But there is one thing that can influence whether or not a species goes extinct that might really surprise you. And that one thing is their name. I know it sounds weird, but how much we care about a species, how much we fear it, what we're willing to do to protect it, and even whether or not we will order it at a restaurant can all be influenced by nothing other than its name. So in today's video, I'm gonna explain how we come up with names for species in the first place and why those names can have such huge implications for not just how we feel about them, but also ultimately what we're willing to do to save them. So first things first. How do we come up with names for species anyway? Well, generally speaking, the names we give species aren't usually that creative. Typically, names include words and information that help us understand something about the species, like where it lives, what it looks like, or some interesting behavior it might have. This means that the name we give a species can potentially tell us a lot about it, even if we've never seen it. For example, the name green tree frog is actually a pretty useful name. It tells me that this animal is a frog, that it's green, and that it sometimes lives in trees, all of which is accurate. Although, to be fair, sometimes they do hang out in toilets. So even if you have never heard of or have seen this species before, you would already know some pretty important things about it. However, sometimes the names we give a species can be a little less direct, but can still be quite useful. For example, a tiger shark isn't actually a tiger with fins that swims around in the ocean. But what a tiger shark does have is stripes, just like a tiger. So this name, even though it's a little less obvious, is still really useful because it reminds us of one of the key identifying traits of a tiger shark, its stripes. It also makes the name a lot easier to remember. However, sometimes this strategy of naming a species after another species because they share a trait, it can confuse people. I look up sharks on the internet and then I see like whale sharks. I'm like, oh, that must mean a whale and a shark have sex. Now to be fair to Tara Reid, she is not the only one to get a little mixed up by these different names for species. For example, there's a group of bats known as flying foxes. With zero context, if I just walked up to you and said, hey, there's a bunch of flying foxes in the park, would you think I was talking about a bat or whatever the hell this is? Apparently it got that name because its face looks like a fox. I would argue that the fox face looks like a bat. So there. There's also a species of bird in the US called bull bats, which is commonly confused for being a bat. So, it just feels like we're doing it on purpose. Basically, while the name we give a species might not seem like a big deal, it plays a really important role in helping people who have never heard of that species before understand what it is and what it does. The name we give a species can either help us really understand it or totally confuse people. Let me give you an example with a little game of word association. If I say the word common, what other words or ideas spring to mind for you? Maybe you think of words like standard, lower class, or basic. Yeah, basic. But for many people, if we call a species common, they often assume that means the species is abundant with a healthy, stable population. The problem is, while this may have been the case when the species was first identified, many species that have common in their name are now threatened with extinction. This is why putting the word common in the name for a species is sometimes quite misleading and confusing, but also potentially dangerous because it implies that a species population is healthy when it really isn't. However, a species name isn't just important because of what it can tell us about their biology. The name we give a species can also trigger different emotions, depending on whether or not we have negative or positive associations with the words in their name. This is why the name we give a species can influence life or death decisions about whether or not we want to save it. Now I realize this might sound like a pretty outlandish claim, but there is research to back it up. In 2010, a team of researchers interviewed students at George Mason University, and they measured the students' level of support to protect 20 different species of birds, wolves, and coyotes. 
The species were divided into two groups. One group had positive sounding names, like the American Song Dog or the Patriot Falcon. The other group had negative sounding names, like the Killer Falcon or the Sheep Eating Eagle. The students were then asked to rate their support for conserving each of these species on a scale of strongly against to strongly support. Now, importantly, the researchers didn't give any of the students any background information on these species. All the students were told were the species names. Once they had completed all their interviews, the research team looked at the average level of support for and against conserving each species. And the results were pretty powerful. On average, students were twice as likely to not conserve species with negative sounding names. In fact, less than half of the students they interviewed supported conserving any species with a negative name at all. In contrast, the species that got the most support for conservation were the species with positive sounding names. Now you might be thinking, Sam, wait a minute. This study has a fatal flaw. Just because the scientists didn't tell the students anything about these species doesn't mean they didn't already know some things about it that influenced their decision. And you would be right if those species actually existed. Yeah, so in order to eliminate that bias where students might have previous knowledge of the species, half of the species on the list were real, like the bald eagle or the sea eagle, and the other half were totally made up and did not exist, like the Patriot Falcon or the Sheep Eating Eagle. That bird on the thumbnail, I got AI to make that for me. I just asked Gemini to make me like a giant scary bird that looked like an eagle eating a baby lamb. And that, that's what it made me. What is really sad about this study is that it found people were more likely to want to protect fake species with positive sounding names than real species with negative sounding names. Another study investigated the emotional response people have to words that are regularly used in the names of different species. Unfortunately, they found that some frequently used words were strongly associated with people feeling things like fear, anger, and disgust. For example, words like false, blind, dark, lesser, or giant were all shown to drive more negative emotions. On the flip side, words like golden, white, green, or angel all elicited more positive emotions. And remember when I mentioned that using the word common in a species name can be confusing if that species isn't actually common? Well, evidently the word common can also stir up quite negative emotions towards species as well. This is because people tend to value species they perceive as rare a lot more than species they perceive as common. So basically the way we rate different colored diamonds is also subconsciously how we value species. <laughs> I think a key takeaway here is that if you're trying to name a newly discovered species, don't use the word common. It seems to just be an all around bad choice. Now you might think that the solution to this problem is simple. Let's just give every species an accurate, positive sounding name. And while that is a good idea, and we should think really carefully about the names that we give newly discovered species, changing the name of an already existing species is much easier said than done. The name of a species can sometimes be very deeply rooted in our culture. It may have been in use for hundreds of years. The name of a species can also change depending on where you live, and species may have different names in different languages. So changing the name of an existing species often requires huge education campaigns to teach everybody about the new name and get them to use it. Plus, if you are going to change the name of a species to try to make it more accurate or positive, you should do some research first to make sure that the new name elicits the correct emotions and response. Because sometimes when you give a species a more positive name, you can also make it sound kind of tasty. Yeah, as it turns out, the name we give a species can not only impact how we feel about it, but also whether or not we decide to eat it. This is why companies will sometimes change the name of the plants and animals they're trying to sell you to make them sound more enticing. For example, which sounds yummier to you? The Chilean sea bass or the Patagonian toothfish? Because it shouldn't matter because they're the same species. I'm, 
I'm sure you saw where I was going with that. I don't think that was much of a cliffhanger. <laughs> Originally called the Patagonian toothfish, the name Chilean sea bass was invented by a fish wholesaler in the 1970s because they wanted to make the name more appealing to an American market. Another example of changing a name to make it sound more delectable is the spiny dogfish. The spiny dogfish is actually a species of shark, but it is commonly sold under its far more appetizing name, rock salmon, which I mean, come on. I get that like, who would want to eat a spiny dogfish, but rock salmon? This shark is neither a salmon nor made of rock. So not even close. <laughs> Both these species, by the way, the Patagonian toothfish and the spiny dogfish are now in danger with extinction because of overfishing. So that rebranding exercise probably worked a little too well. However, this type of rebranding can cut both ways. For example, PETA ran a campaign where they tried to rename fish sea kittens. I think the idea here was that nobody would want to hurt a kitten, so you know, you're not gonna hurt a sea kitten. I'm just gonna check my notes real quick though, and yes, people still eat a lot of fish everywhere, so. I'm not sure that worked. So where does all of this leave us? Well, ultimately, if the goal is to conserve a species, we need to think really carefully about the words that we put in their name because they can secretly trigger strong emotions like fear, love, or hunger. <laughs> in a modern world where there is a lot of competition for attention and donations, Something as simple as the name we give an animal or a plant can have a really big impact on conservation outcomes. So we always need to remember that when giving out names. Having said all of that, before you click away from this video thinking that a species name is all that matters, that isn't the whole story. There are actually a lot of different factors that can affect how we feel about a species and ultimately what we're willing to do to protect them. For example, things like how cute or beautiful we think a species is or its historical value to society can all have a much bigger impact on our willingness to donate to save a species than just its name. How familiar somebody is with a species, for example, whether or not they've interacted with it in the past and whether or not those interactions have been positive, can also influence whether or not someone is willing to donate money to save a species. How species are depicted in film and television, in particular how they are depicted interacting with people, can also have a substantial impact impact on how we feel about them and whether or not we're going to want to protect them. Sometimes our feelings about species can be influenced by really weird stuff too. Like one study found that we are more likely to want to protect big species than small species. So while there is a lot of evidence to suggest that the name we give a species can influence how we feel about them and whether or not we're willing to protect them, there are also a variety of other factors that can impact our emotions and decision making when it comes to conservation issues. But thinking carefully about the name we give a species and being aware of our own bias can really help improve our perspectives on different plants and animals which can hopefully increase the odds of success for conservation programs. All right, everybody, that is it for me this time. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Feel free in the comments below to share some of your favorite animal and plant names. Do they make you afraid? Do they disgust you? Do they make you want to cuddle them? Tell me how they make you feel. I've also done a few other videos where I discuss other causes for extinction, so you can go ahead and check those out. Again, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Both of these species, by the way, the Patagonian toothfish and the Chilean sea bass, wait. It just got me, it just got me. Oh.